แล้ววันตัวเองตัวบีคอนติเนียร์ด้วยท็อปไฮท์ซีรีส์ออฟวาร์วาตัวด็อกิเมนต์เรื่องจิสปัตตูไอเลมิเรตต์ตัดตัดพอลีด้วยคัมเพลตเอซีออฟตัดสักแห่งวาร์วาร์วาร์วาตัวด็อกิเมนต์เรื่องอินพาร์ทวันสัมชิดเวนดาวน์ไอทิงจามานีวัสอับอัลตูลูสฟอนด์ดัสโฮเบียตเนลันแอนพาลฮาเบลวัสเดสโตรดอัลซัมติงไอเลสคอนติเนียร์ด้วยบิดเดอร์ดิสอับอัลนี่อาวาลองซ์อ่ะเฮ้ยกู On December the 12th, 1937, the U.S. naval gunboat USS Panay was sailing up the Yangtze River. The Panay was a flat-bottomed vessel built in Shanghai mm. specifically for operation. They are almost touching the water on the Great River, which at over 3,000 miles long was the longest in Asia, and stretched deep into China. Both Great Britain and the United States had invested heavily in China for many years. Exploiting its resources, including its greatest of all, its hardworking and cheaply employed people. Mm. Indeed, many cities in China, like the capital of Nanking, had foreign districts built along the same lines of suburbs in Washington or London. However, China was not a unified country and had been in the grips of an ideological power struggle since 1927, fought between the government and the Communist Party of China. Japan also occupied parts of the country, but looked to exploit the civil war to gain even more territory in Manchuria. And so, in 1931, manufactured a terrorist attack against a Japanese railway line. This was then used as a precursor for an invasion, which saw China surrender Manchuria to Japan. But skirmishes continued until, in the summer of 1937, Japan finally launched a full-scale invasion. Almost medieval acts of brutality carried out against the Chinese people by Japanese soldiers, with looting, rape, and mass murder Jeez. being not only commonplace but actually encouraged by the Japanese leadership. There were some cruel people. In one shocking incident, two Japanese officers held a competition to see who could decapitate 100 people with a samurai Jeez. sword the fastest. That's and the incident was well publicized in Japan. It's also been remembered as the Rape of Nanking. With all this happening in China, both Britain and the U.S. send their navies up the Yangtze to protect their respective peoples and property, but to remain a neutral force in the fighting on land. By December 1937, the Japanese were encroaching on Nanking itself, where a large number of Americans lived and worked, and so the USS Panay was instructed to begin evacuating them on December the 11th. Okay. The skies were abuzz with Japanese warplanes, and so the Americans adorned the vessel with large U.S. flags to distinguish them from Chinese vessels. Early the next morning, the British gunboat HMS Ladybird was shelled by Japanese forces on shore, but managed to escape serious damage. Mm. Later, the USS Panay found itself attracting unwanted attention from 12 Japanese planes, and then later a Japanese gunboat. Despite the large American flags, the Japanese planes attacked the American gunboat and three nearby tankers with bombs and machine gun fire. Over 50 civilians and crew on board were wounded, and then rescued by HMS Ladybird and HMS B as the Panay sank. While three Americans, Charles L. Esminger, Carl H. Carlson, and Edgar C. Holsebus, were killed in the attack, along okay. with an Italian reporter. They would be the first Americans to die in battle between the forces of the Imperial Japanese and the United States of America. Almost exactly four years before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The scope of Japanese nationalism was realized at the Zhongma Fortress, where from 1936, a Japanese doctor named Shiro Ishii, began a series of gruesome medical experiments on human beings Jeez, to that's not good. and chemical weapons for the Japanese army. He had been inspired by research carried out in Europe and had convinced the Japanese emperor to sanction Japan's own research, which he believed would allow Japan to kill large numbers of enemy forces quickly, something the Japanese needed desperately if they had plans to face the numerically superior Chinese or Soviet Union. When the fortress was attacked by resistant fighters a year later, he relocated his operation to Pingfang, where the now notorious Unit 731 was established. There, thousands of Chinese civilians and later allied POWs were used in his nightmarish medical experiments to develop biological and chemical weapons, as well as carry out experimental surgeries. Mm. Unit 731 also trialed its biological weapons against Chinese populations 
Men, women, children, animals, and even newborn infants were all used by Shiro Ushii's <laughs> team to carry out their research. Throughout the 1930s, this Japanese troops in Manchuria fought a series of one-off skirmishes with Chinese troops, culminating in full-scale war erupting again on July the 7th, 1937. After years of fighting one another, the two sides of the Chinese Civil War, the Kuomintang and the Communists, called a ceasefire and united against the Japanese, who took the Kuomintang's capital city of Nanking in December 1937. The brutality of Japanese forces against the Chinese, coupled with the attacks on the American vessel USS Penney and US delegates in Nanking, turned the United States firmly against Japan. But US President Franklin Roosevelt believed that the US was more likely to get embroiled in war in Europe than the Far East. Mm. Thus, while he authorized cash payments to the Chinese to fund their war efforts against the Japanese, and even allowed American pilots to fight for the Chinese Air Force as part of the famous Flying Tigers unit, he remained more focused on preparing to confront Hitler. This played into Japan's hands as they continued their expansion into China and Southeast Asia. But under continuing pressure from his military commanders, Roosevelt did authorize increasingly tougher restrictions on trade with Japan in an effort to punish them for their actions in China beginning in 1938. The Japanese themselves also viewed war with America as unlikely and were more concerned with another conflict breaking out with the Soviet Union north of their Manchurian conquests. But the American embargoes did hurt them and cause alarm in the Japanese leadership. Nevertheless, in September 1940, a week before Japan joined the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy, Japanese troops entered French Indochina, now Vietnam, escalating what the US and UK saw as a growing crisis in Asia. Mm. At first, the Japanese only used Indochina as a base for troops in the event of a war with the Soviet Union. But when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, Japan occupied the rest of the country and would continue to do so until 1945. After Japanese troops entered French Indochina, the US placed their toughest sanctions yet on Japan by embargoing vital scrap metal exports and barring Japanese ships from using the Panama Canal. Tensions between both sides rose throughout That's a lot of choices. leading to a series of negotiations to bring about a peaceful solution. But the Japanese military, especially the Navy, viewed war with the US as inevitable. The Japanese had by that time plans to invade British, Dutch and French possessions deeper into Southern Asia as part of its plans under its Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere concept such as Brunei and the Dutch East Indies. But this expansion would leave them vulnerable to attack from the US based in the Philippines should they decide to interfere. Therefore, they began to draw up plans for a decisive attack on the US Navy in an effort to destroy it before it could mobilize. As early as 1940, the Japanese began theorizing plans for an attack on Hawaii and the Philippines. Mm. By April 1941, the Japanese began training for an attack on the US naval base at Pearl Harbor, in what they had dubbed Operation Z, which was the brainchild of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. The pilots trained to attack ships in Pearl Harbor using air-launched torpedoes, but the problem was that these weapons tended to dive deeper than the shallow waters of the harbor allowed. The Japanese came up with a cunning solution, wooden fins that forced the torpedo to rise up immediately after hitting the water. Jeez. On November the 26th, Man, they really it out. 1941, the Japanese fleet set sail for Hawaii under strict radio silence. At the time, both the US and Washington were still negotiating, but Roosevelt's government had by then began demanding Japan withdrew from China altogether, something totally unthinkable to the Japanese leadership. The fleet comprised of six aircraft carriers with 359 fighters and bombers, making it the most powerful naval aviation force in history at that time. On December the 1st, Yamamoto was informed that war with the Dutch, US and UK had been authorized by the Japanese leadership. But should it appear that both sides were about to reach an amicable solution prior to December the 7th, then he should authorize to pull the fleet back and cancel the attack. Endowed with intelligent photographs of Pearl Harbor taken by a Japanese spy aboard a sightseeing aircraft, 
Mm. Yamamoto made his final preparations on December the 6th, and with no sign of a peaceful solution, the next morning the aircraft took off from their carriers. The air attack was preceded by a group of Japanese midget submarines that attempted to sneak into the harbour, but one of them was attacked and sunk by the destroyer, USS Ward, which fired the first American shots of the Pacific theatre of World War II. This should have alerted the Americans to an attack, but the information did not reach the US Admiralty in time. Meanwhile, an American radar station spotted the formation of Japanese aircraft, but was told that it was a flight of B-17s arriving from mainland USA, and mm. so no action was taken. Damn. At Pearl Harbor, the, they didn't know. the sailors were waking up and preparing for a routine Sunday with naval bands playing songs while the skies began to fill with aircraft. The Americans were taken completely by surprise, and the bands were still playing as the first bombs and torpedoes struck the ships. Jeez. During the course of the attack, the Japanese damaged or sank eight American battleships, three cruisers, three destroyers, an anti-aircraft training ship, and a mine layer. That's awful. A number of nearby US Army airfields were also hit in air raids. The aircraft based there had been bunched together on the ground to make it easier to guard them against possible sabotage. But all this did was increase the damage caused by the bombs as they landed amongst them. In all, the US lost 2,403 service personnel in the course of the attack, Jeez. while over a thousand more were seriously wounded. The damage could have been greater had Yamamoto not decided to cancel a follow-up attack because they had lost the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. The Japanese lost 29 aircraft and 5 midget submarines that attempted to participate in the attack. All in all, 64 Japanese were killed, while one Japanese Navy officer, Kazuo Sakamaki, was captured alive after his submarine was grounded, becoming the first okay. Japanese prisoner of war taken by the Americans. Crucially, however, and almost purely by chance, the US Navy's aircraft carriers were not present at the harbor and thus survived unscathed. Damn. The next That's so lucky. day, President Roosevelt met with the US Congress to ask them to vote on declaring war on Japan. The vote was almost unanimously in favor of war, save for one objection by Representative Janet Rankin of Montana. She told Congress, as a woman, I cannot go to war, and I refuse to send anyone else. In his speech, Roosevelt described December the 7th as a date which would live in infamy. Less than four days after Pearl Harbor was attacked, Adolf Hitler, acting on his own authority and without consulting his staff, ordered his government to declare war on the US in support of Japan, and in response to what he viewed as the USA violating its neutrality by supporting Britain. For the United States of America, the Second World War had begun. Damn. Japan's pre six months. Admiral Yamamoto predicted that after the opening of hostilities with the USA, Japan would have six months with which to decisively defeat the US in the Pacific, to such an extent that Washington would have to sue for peace, which would effectively surrender the Pacific and Asia to Tokyo. Few in Japan truly believed that an invasion of the US mainland was a possibility, given how overstretched Japan was already with its war, which was primarily aimed at British and Dutch Empire territories, with the grand prize being Australia itself. The reason he gave six months was because that was how long he predicted it would take for the mighty US industrial complex to fully gear up for war, after which Japan could not hope to match American war production. The Japanese therefore wasted little time and began their own form of blitzkrieg in the east. Mm. Within 24 hours of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese troops had attacked British forces in Malaya and Hong Kong, and American forces on the Philippines. On December the 10th, two British battlecruisers, HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse, sailed to attack the Japanese, but were sunk by Japanese aircraft. Damn. This attack finally convinced the world's navies that aircraft were now displacing surface vessels as the most powerful weapons of naval warfare. Mm. The battle for the Philippines saw some of Japan's most experienced soldiers pitted against the numerically superior but mixed bag of defenders who varied from US regular forces down to police officers and volunteers. 
the Japanese quickly overrun them despite a valiant defense, but pockets of stern American resistance would continue in the Batanan Peninsula until May the following year, by which time these men had become famously known as the Battling Bastards of Batanan. Ultimately defeated, the American and Filipino fighters then found themselves facing the horror of the Bataan Death March, which saw nearly 80,000 exhausted and wounded men march 70 miles into captivity. Mm. If any of them became too weak to walk, they were bayoneted by their captors and left Jeez. to die. Hong Kong fell on Christmas Day 1941. Like in China, the population found themselves the subject of rape and murder at the hands of the Japanese, especially those of European origin. A few weeks later, the Japanese attacked the Solomon Islands, beginning one of the most bitter campaigns of the war. Holding the Solomon Islands allowed the Japanese to attack shipping carrying vital war supplies from the US to Australia and New Zealand. Australia was now seriously under threat from attack by the Japanese, which was realized on March the 3rd, 1942, when Japanese planes attacked British and Australian planes at Broome in Western Australia. On February the 8th, 1942, Japanese troops launched their offensive against British Singapore. Despite a staunch defense, the garrison was forced to surrender a little over a week later. Like in Hong Kong, the population was subject to shocking brutality, including one incident that saw doctors, nurses, and patients of a hospital bayoneted. A month later saw the start of the Burma campaign with the Japanese aim of securing the major seaport of Rangoon <laughs> and close land supply routes to the Chinese. The Japanese were joined in their effort by Indian and Burmese nationalist armies who wanted to remove the British from their countries. An army from Thailand also supported the Japanese, but it was here where their advance would finally start to bog down. The dense jungle and intense weather made fighting here bitter, painful, and slow. Okay, and true. despite their best efforts, the Japanese failed to break the Allied defense. The Burma campaign would continue until the end of the war as the Allies slowly pushed the Japanese back. On April the 18th, the US carried out a daring raid against the Japanese home islands when a force of US Army Air Force B-25 Mitchell bombers were launched from the aircraft carrier USS Hornet. The 16 bombers were led by Lieutenant Colonel James Jimmy Doolittle and split up to attack targets in Tokyo, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka before flying on to China. The raid achieved very little in terms of strategic importance, but at a time when the Japanese seemed unstoppable in the Pacific, it sent US morale soaring. At sea, the US Navy was rapidly mobilizing its forces to stop the Japanese advancing towards the west coast of America, mm. resulting in an engagement between American and Japanese vessels at the Battle of Coral Sea on May the 4th, 1942. The battle saw aircraft as the main means of fighting, and as such was the first naval battle in history where the ships of both sides never saw one another. Damn. The Americans took significant casualties, including the loss of a vital aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington, but succeeded in momentarily halting the Japanese advance, and perhaps most significantly, damaging two Japanese carriers that were forced to return home for repairs. On June the 3rd, a small Japanese fort the Battle of the Coral Sea would prove especially significant, when on June the 4th, 1942, US and Japanese naval forces met again in the Battle of Midway Island. Midway Island was one of the last objectives before the Japanese could invade Hawaii, and as such, it was vital to both sides who deployed the bulk of their carrier forces. The Japanese had four aircraft carriers rather than the six they should have had, mm. had it not been for the damage sustained in the earlier battle. Okay. The Americans, on the other hand, only had three, and the air battles that followed saw some of the most intense air combat in history. The Americans attacked the Japanese carriers with torpedo bombers, which took the brunt of the Japanese defensive fire. High above, however, American dive bombers virtually stumbled across the Japanese carriers and made their attack almost unopposed. Damn. The wooden decks of the carriers were covered with ammunition and aviation fuel, so when the bombs detonated, their effect was greatly increased. 
the Japanese would lose all four carriers in the battle, something they would never recover from, while the Americans lost just one, the USS Yorktown. The Japanese had finally been halted, and now began so, uh, a slow US island one. campaign to push them back to Japan, starting in August with an American offensive against the island of Guadalcanal. Yamamoto had been proved correct. After six months of victory, the Japanese lost the initiative and the tide had well and truly turned against them. He would not see to live Japan's ultimate defeat, for he was killed when his personal transport aircraft was shot down by American fighters on April the 18th, 1943. Like Rommel, his memory is as respected in Allied countries as his own. Damn. New Year, New War. America's entry into the war against Nazi Germany began in earnest, with the first American troops arriving in Britain by the end of January. Meanwhile, Germany's U-boats were now permitted to extend their operations right up to the American coastline in order to strike at convoys as they left port. However, now the U-boat commanders had to contend with the American warships hunting them, as well as British and Canadian warships. Despite this, the U-boats continued to inflict painful losses on the Allies. 1942 opened with two significant events in the course of human history. The first occurred on January the 1st, when 26 nations, excluding any of the Axis power, signed the United Nations Charter. The UN was to replace the failed League of Nations and had a greater degree of authority to intervene on the world stage in the future. The second occurred three weeks later, but had a much darker tone. On January the 20th, key Nazi figures met at the Vansi Conference, chaired by Reinhard Heydrich, to discuss implementing the final solution against Jews and other undesirables in Nazi-controlled lands. This helped establish the policy for eradicating large numbers of people quickly using gas. Heydrich would be killed before the Third Reich's brutal ambitions came to full fruition, as he was assassinated in a British orchestrated attack by Czech freedom fighters five months later, mere days before the gassing at Auschwitz began. On the Eastern Front, the Germans and their Axis allies prepared for a fresh summer offensive against the Soviet Union, which was still recovering from the setbacks it had encountered in the opening battles. At Leningrad, the German army was laying siege to the city, whose population stubbornly refused to surrender. In May, the Germans launched an ultimately successful offensive into Crimea in the Ukraine. Mm. And then in June, they lay siege to Sevastopol, which held out until July the 3rd. The Germans then pressed onto a city on the edge of the river Volga, whose name would become synonymous with the brutal nature of the Eastern Front, Stalingrad. With the city bearing the name of their leader, the Soviets would fight tooth and nail to keep the city from falling into German hands, not only for strategic reasons, but for symbolic purposes as well. Between late August 1942 and early February 1943, both sides fought house to house for control of the now ruined city. In November 1942, the Soviets attacked the Romanian and Hungarian units supporting the German 6th Army fighting inside the city, trapping them there and cutting them off from supplies. Attempts to get supplies to the Germans by air failed, and by February the Germans had lost the battle amidst another harsh Russian winter. Damn. Nearly 2 million soldiers and civilians would Jeez, be lost in the battle lot. for the city. In Western Europe, British and Canadian forces planned to raid the French port of Dieppe, with the primary aim being to prove that an Allied assault on occupied France was possible. It was also meant to reassure Stalin that the Western Allies remained committed to opening up another front to relieve his own forces. And they all dead. Launched on August the 19th, the raid was a near disaster, with almost 60% of the force being killed, captured or wounded. While it failed to achieve its immediate objectives, it did teach the Allies valuable lessons about such large amphibious assaults that would be applied in the future. Reaping the whirlwind. Whirlwind. During the interwar years, aircraft technology advanced considerably, 
With bomber aircraft especially becoming larger, faster, able to fly higher and carry a greater bomb load across the length of the European continent. As war broke out, even more powerful four-engine bombers such as the American B-17 Flying Fortress and British Avro Lancaster were on the drawing board. But the problem was that there was no truly accurate way to drop bombs onto a target from altitude. Mm. Dive bombing could put a bomb onto a target the size of a tank, but this could only be achieved by smaller aircraft such as the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka, which is why dive bombing was primarily used to support the army or attack ships. Okay. By the late 1930s, a frightening new doctrine in air warfare was considered by air force leaders across the world that called for the use of armadas of bombers to drop huge numbers of bombs over a large area of strategic significance. These targets would often center around industrial complexes such as factories or refineries, but would also include the homes of the workers who lived nearby and Jeez. the infrastructure to support those people, their shops, churches or anything to do with everyday life. Finally, the death toll such acts would create was seen as being enough to drive the survivors mad with fear, leading to a breakdown of social order and with the country no longer able to function, it would be forced to surrender. This doctrine was known by many terms, carpet bombing, aerial denial, strategic bombing, but the truth was it was little more than a government sanctioned act of military terrorism. Hitler and the Nazi leadership especially believed in such tactics reflecting their views of the inferior peoples outside of Germany. The Nazis gave the world a taste of the power of such operations during the Spanish Civil War, and then again during the invasion of Poland. In both instances, the Germans were ultimately victorious, but this had more to do with the events on the ground with the German army. It would not be until the Battle of Britain that the concept was truly put into practice, with German bombers attacking British cities such as London, Coventry, Liverpool, Cardiff, and even Belfast in Northern Ireland. Known as the Blitz, from September 1940 until May 1941, German bombers launched a massive offensive against British cities in the hope that it would crush Britain's resolve to continue the war. In the early days of the Blitz, the British leadership feared that the Germans were achieving their aims as large numbers of people began fleeing the cities, which acted as makeshift shelters something the government tried to avoid. However, as other cities were attacked, the population who left began returning, except for the children who were evacuated for the duration of the war. Okay. The feared collapse of social order failed to materialize, and with Germany preparing the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, the Luftwaffe withdrew much of its bomber force to support the Eastern and African campaign. However, over 45,000 people perished in the Blitz, and rather than achieve victory for the Germans, it instead hardened British resolve, which now called for revenge for those lost. To some observers, the failure of the Blitz demonstrated the inadequacies of trying to terror bomb populations into submission. Some engineers in Britain, like the gifted Barnes Wallace, believed he had a solution to the problem of accuracy with a proposal to create very heavy bombs carried by super heavy bombers. The very heavy bombs didn't stray from their arm point like the lighter bombs often did, making it easier to predict where they would land Jeez. and thus increase accuracy. Later in the war, Wallace's proposals would be proven correct with British bombers being able to strike targets such as narrow viaducts and ships from altitude. Wallace and his supporters wanted to build a fleet of these super heavy bombers to target Germany's factories and shipyards, thus denying the Germans the ability to build the very tools for war. But he was met with open hostility from some of the RAF leadership, many of whom incredibly still saw the value of area bombing. One man in particular believed in its ability, namely Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris who took over the RAF Bomber Command in 1941. Supported by Churchill, Harris called for the RAF to start area bombing key German cities in an effort to bring Germany to its knees with operations beginning in 1942, now supported by the US Army Air Forces. The Soviet Union also attacked German cities, including Berlin, 
but this was not in conjunction with the Western Allies, and was often in retaliation or for propaganda purposes. Mm. Harris used the Blitz as justification for his campaign. As he put it, the Nazis entered the war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everyone else, and nobody was going to bomb them. They showed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. Damn. Harris learned the wrong lessons from the Blitz. Firstly, he believed that a population living under a totalitarian regime such as Nazi Germany would break under a sustained bombing campaign, since True. the urge to be free would go stronger as resentment towards the Nazis grew. Secondly, he believed that the German Luftwaffe lacked the bomber force necessary for such a campaign to be successful, since it was primarily organized in support of the German army, rather than strategic operations as the RAF increasingly was. Harris and his supporters were initially disappointed with the early results, citing continuing issues with navigation, which was especially a problem for the RAF, who flew their operations at night to protect them from Germany's day fighter forces. This would be addressed over time with the use of navigational beacons and later radar sets on board the aircraft. The US aircrew who flew bombers with better protection than their RAF counterparts flew in daylight, which greatly improved navigational accuracy. Mm. But the bombers were harassed by enemy fighters almost the whole way to the target and back again, leading to heavy losses. Jeez. So heavy were the losses in the early days that at one point the US considered abandoning daylight operations and joining the RAF at night with a handful of US bombers flying night missions with the RAF for trial purposes. Damn. Harris believed the solution was to simply increase the number of aircraft in the air to increase the devastation below and cooperative protection for the aircraft. This led to Operation Millennium, a bold plan that called for over a thousand RAF bombers, nearly every available aircraft in bomber command, including training aircraft to take to the skies against a single city, namely Cologne. On May the 30th, the city was subjected to the most concentrated single air attack in history up to that point. Over the next two and a half years, Allied bombers smashed German cities in the belief it would defeat Germany. But as had been proven in the Blitz against London, it only hardened the German people's resolve and tied up much of the Allied resources. It was not entirely a failure, however, since it did indeed destroy much of Germany's industrial complex, okay. forcing them to relocate factories into mountains or hidden in the countryside. But it did fail to achieve the victory Harris promised. For much of the war, the Allied bomber crews were seen as heroes, since for a time, they were the only force taking the war directly to Nazi Germany. As the end of the war came in sight, however, and pictures of what Allied bombing had done to Germany were seen around the world, the populations of Britain and the US began to turn against Harris and the bomber crews. However, Harris would remain unapologetic for the rest of his life. Africa and Italy. Hitler's decision to invade the Soviet Union and then declare war on the United States was made while Rommel's Africa Corps was still fighting the British 8th Army in Africa, a force which would forever be known as the Desert Rats. British and Commonwealth forces had begun receiving large numbers of more advanced American-made tanks, such as the M3 Grant and M4 Sherman, which greatly helped redress the balance with Germany's tank forces. With the US now fully engaged against Nazi Germany, Rommel knew that time was no longer a luxury he could afford. He had to achieve victory against the British forces and secure North Africa quickly before the Americans could land their troops in force. All the while, he faced a never-ending problem with supplies as Hitler focused his attention on the Soviet Union. Rommel began 1942 with a fresh offensive and slowly began to push the British back across Egypt. His genius as a leader was emphasized by his ability to achieve a lot with very little, but a shortage of fuel was forever a headache for him and repeatedly slowed his advance eastward. On August the 13th, the Desert Rats received a new commander. His name was Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. And like Rommel, he had a personality to match his tactical skill. Right. Known affectionately as Monty to his men and the public, he wore a unique two-badge barrette 
drove around in a specially modified M3 tank and kept a picture of Rommel in his office to remind him of his enemy whenever he made his plans, a tradition maintained by American and British tank units to this very day. By August the 31st, 1942, the British forces were boxed in around Al Alamein, where Rommel made what he believed to be his final push to the Nile. However, well-prepared British defences saw the attack fail, and so Rommel attempted to outflank them to the south, which only saw his forces run out of fuel and fall back. Finally, on October the 23rd, Monty launched his great counter-offensive from Al Alamein. It began with an incredible 900 artillery gun barrage that saturated the Germans for days before Monty's tanks pushed forward. Damn. After a series of bitter battles and with the help of a reinvigorated RAF supported by new American aircraft dominating the skies above the desert, Rommel began his long retreat back with Monty in pursuit. As Monty chased Rommel back into Libya, worse news for the German general was to come on November the 8th, 1942 when a huge force of American and British troops supported by pro-allied Vichy French troops landed in Morocco and Algeria to the west of Libya. Dubbed Operation Torch, the landings were the first major American-British joint operation and was under the command of US General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Thus, the further west Rommel retreated from Monty's enemy, the closer he got to Eisenhower's army that was advancing towards him. Over the coming year, Rommel would continue to fight an increasingly hopeless battle, having to contend with immense Allied forces on two fronts, all the while suffering chronic supply shortages and having to contend with Hitler, who was increasingly uninterested with Africa. Mm. Even when Hitler released supplies for Rommel, they were increasingly being intercepted by American and British naval forces that were swarming the Mediterranean. Throughout April 1943, it was clear the campaign in Africa was lost and not wanting to lose one of the Third Reich's most esteemed generals, Hitler ordered Rommel back to Germany as the Africa Corps finally collapsed in May 1943. Defeat in North Africa left the south of Nazi-occupied Europe and their ally Italy exposed to Allied bombers and ships, as well as increasingly denying them the use of the Mediterranean. Rommel himself would later commit suicide after being implicated in a plot Jeez. to kill Hitler. There was now debate among the Allies as what to do next. The Soviet Union had been demanding the Western Allies open up a second front in Europe since America entered the war. The Americans agreed and wanted to strike France as soon as possible, but Churchill on the other hand believed that Italy would be the best setting for opening up a new front in Europe. Fascist dictator Benito Mussolini was increasingly losing his grip on power, and Churchill believed that if Italy was invaded, his government would fall, and so would any organised resistance. For this reason, he labelled Italy Europe's soft underbelly, and Jeez. at the Casablanca conference, he managed to convince Roosevelt to agree to support an attack. Dubbed Operation Husky, on July the 9th, 1943, American and British paratroopers and amphibious assault forces landed on the south side of Sicily and began pushing north. Prior to the invasion, the British carried out a successful disinformation operation involving the use of a dead man's body dressed in a Royal Marines officer's uniform and released it by submarine near Spain with plans for an allied invasion of Greece. The okay. Germans recovered the body and believed the plans to be genuine and so focused their defensive efforts on Greece and not on Sicily. In less than a month, the entire island was under Allied control, which allowed it to act as a springboard for the Allied invasion of mainland Italy, which began on September the 3rd. Allied forces first landed at Taranto on the heel of Italy, followed by landings at Calabria and Salerno a week later. As Churchill predicted, Italy was quickly destabilizing to the point where Mussolini was removed from power on July the 24th, 1943. The new Italian government began secretly negotiating an armistice with the Allies before Allied troops even landed in Italy. It was announced publicly on September the 8th and additional Allied landings were made unopposed, but the Germans had caught on to what was happening and moved in to take over key defensive positions and disarm a now potentially hostile Italian army. 
This led to opening fighting between the former allies, and on September the 9th, the Italian battleship Roma was sunk by German aircraft Roma. in what was the first attack in history carried out using air-launched anti-ship missiles. All right. On the Greek islands of Cephalonia, Italian forces battled German troops for over a week and a half before being defeated, and thousands of Italian prisoners were then massacred by the Jeez. Germans. On September the 12th, 1943, Mussolini was rescued from prison in a daring raid by German special forces and flown to northern Italy, which was under German control. Italy was now in a de facto state of civil war, with the pro-allied south battling the pro-Nazi north, which had been rebranded as the Italian Social Republic. Any hopes of sweeping through Italy by Christmas 1943 were soon dashed. However, as the Germans and their remaining Italian allies organized a tough defense along the Winter Line, a series of three defensive lines cantered around protecting the strategically important monastery of Monte Cassino. Okay. The Allies would continue advancing north through to the end of 1943, but it was a slow and painful process. As the Western Allies slogged through Italy, the Soviets continued their fight to repel the Germans it's just put this from the movie. through the Soviet Union. On July the 5th, 1943, the Germans launched Operation Citadel, sparking the Battle of Kursk. This battle saw such an immense use of tank forces by both sides that it remained the largest single tank battle in history. Having realized the battle would take place at the Kursk salient, the Soviets had ample time to prepare their defenses and for the first time in the war, a German strategic advance failed. Mm. The re-energized and reorganized Soviet forces had by now learned from their early mistakes and were taking the initiative against the German invaders. Having lost their momentum on the Eastern Front and with Allied troops pushing through Italy, the noose was tightened around Nazi Germany. In the Pacific, the situation for Japan was no better as they continued their own retreat back to their home islands, which were themselves now the subject of air raids by the new B-29 Super Fortress strategic bombers okay. flying from India and China. In January 1944, Soviet forces finally lifted the siege of Leningrad. The city had held out for two years and nearly five months and had even continued undertaking limited tank production, but at the cost of an estimated half a million dead. Jeez. The immense Soviet army now began steamrolling their way west, pushing the Germans and their Axis allies further back. On March the 26th, Soviet troops pursued the Germans into Romania and over a month later, retook the Crimea. In Italy, the battle for the German-held territory around the monastery of Monte Cassino began. Between January and May, the Allies launched four major offensives against the Germans there, which was key to their defensive lines protecting pro-Axis northern Italy. But dogged German resistance repelled them until finally, on May the 18th, 1944, the Allies broke through along a 20-mile line. Damn. The victory cost the Allies 55,000 men and was met with a great deal of criticism when the ancient monastery itself was bombed by Allied warplanes. Jeez, that's harsh. At the same time the Allies were fighting at Monte Cassino, another Allied force landed at Anzio in an attempt to outflank the main German defensive lines. It was under the command of US Army Major General John Lucas, and despite landing and establishing a beachhead, the Allies found themselves contained there until May, by which time Lucas had been relieved of his command. With the victory of Cassino and the breakout from Anzio, the Allies pushed towards Rome, with the first US Army units arriving at the city on June the 4th. In the Far East, the Japanese launched a major offensive to push British Empire forces out of Burma and into India. Despite some early gains and the charismatically brutal nature of jungle warfare, the Japanese were halted and then pushed back. It would prove one of the last major offensives that the Japanese could muster. In the Pacific, the island hopping campaigns continued, with many Japanese garrisons now being starved of supplies, thanks to an increasingly effective US Navy submarine blockade of Damn. the Japanese home islands. 
Nevertheless, the fanatical Japanese made the Allies pay for every inch of ground. Stalin had been calling for the opening of a Western Front in Europe since the Americans joined the war in order to ease pressure on his forces. The paranoid dictator even confided in some of his aides that he believed the West were deliberately delaying opening a front in order to wear down the Soviet forces. By 1944, the Western Allies were finally preparing to storm Fortress Europe, which would force the now outnumbered Germans and their Axis supporters to commit resources to three battlefronts. Just like Hitler, when he planned to invade Britain, the Allies knew that any crossing of the English Channel had to be made in the summer months because the weather afterwards would prove too hazardous. Okay. Britain therefore became the history's biggest staging post in the first half of 1944. It seemed as though every available piece of land was being turned into an airfield for aircraft or parking lots for tanks and trucks. Knowing that German aircraft were still carrying out reconnaissance over the UK, the Allies devised ingenious ways of confusing the Germans' intelligence pictures, such as inflatable tanks and wooden aeroplanes that looked real enough on reconnaissance okay. photos taken at high altitude. Zabate. Finally, by June 1944, the Allies were ready to launch an invasion. Dubbed Operation Overlord, it was under the command of the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, and it was decided to land troops at Normandy rather than the more obvious choice of Calais, which was a shorter journey between the UK and France. The RAF and USAAF had spent months softening up defences along the Germans' so-called Atlantic Wall, while French resistance gathered intelligence on German forces in the area, as well as conducting sabotage of transport links. On June the 6th, D-Day began with an immense airborne invasion of Normandy by Allied paratroopers. They were parachuted in behind the lines in an effort to outflank the main German defenders along the coast. Okay. In the early hours of the morning, the main amphibious force landed at five beaches, each given their own codename. American beaches were Utah and Omaha, British beaches were Gold and Sword, and the Canadian beach was Juno. Despite intense fighting and heavy casualties, the Allies had secured the beachhead and opened the Western Front. The previous experiences at Jeppe, Salerno, Anzio, and the Pacific had taught the Allies well how to best conduct amphibious operations, mm. culminating in this, the invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe. On three whole fronts, the Allies were now pushing the Germans back to the fatherland. Good. Despite the numerical advantage the Allies enjoyed, the Germans were still able to demonstrate their extraordinary technological prowess. A week after D-Day, the first V-1 flying bombs began to rain down on London. While they lacked the accuracy to greatly affect the outcome of the war, they did terrorise the southeast of England Jeez. and distracted the Allies by having them focus on bombing their launch sites. This would be reinforced later with the introduction of the V-2, which became the blueprint for today's intercontinental ballistic missiles. Germany had also introduced the first operational jet fighter, the ME-262. These wonder weapons had an unexpected advantage for the Allies, however. Hitler had such great faith in Germany's missiles, rocket fighters and super tanks, that he diverted much needed resources into their development rather than allocating those resources to more conventional but proven weapons. Okay. The immaturity of the technology meant that they weren't able to deliver the results Hitler fantasized about, and so their continued development only hampered Germany's war effort by tying up increasingly limited resources. Knowing this, a secret plot to kill Hitler with a bomb was devised by some of his generals, but the plot failed and the conspirators were executed. In July, the Russians reached Poland, while in August, the Western Allies had liberated Paris. The Germans were now in full retreat, as the Allies carefully but steadily advanced east, but Field Marshal Montgomery devised a daring plan to speed up the defeat of Germany, involving the use of paratroopers to capture a series of bridges across the Rhine and Mass rivers in the Netherlands and Germany. Ground forces would then race towards the bridges to secure them and allow Allied troops to flood into Germany itself. It was a risky plan, leading one British general to famously say, I think we may be going a bridge too far. 
However, Monty had managed to convince Eisenhower, and the operation began on September the 17th. Code named Market Guard Ifik at the Battle of Leyte Gulf on October the 25th. Allied forces had discovered a new terror unleashed upon them, mm. the kamikaze. These were planes flown deliberately into ships, making them essentially manned missiles, and some Japanese admirals believed they were now the only way to turn the tide Jeez. against the Allied navies. Incredibly, such was the belief in the righteousness of such suicidal acts, there was no shortage of volunteers. Later, Damn. the kamikaze doctrine would include ramming Allied bombers, and even specially developed rocket-powered aircraft. The beginning of the end. After the Battle of the Bulge, it was clear to most people that E-1 flying bomb became the last bomb to fall on British soil in the war. For Germany, however, the air raids only intensified, with Dresden being hit by over 1,300 American and British bombers over a two-day period in February. Jeez. In April, the last German resistance in the Ruhr is suppressed, leading to a staggering 370,000 German soldiers being taken prisoner. On the Eastern Front, Russian troops swept through Poland and into East Germany and Austria, taking Vienna on April the 13th. During their advance, thousands of Germans in Poland became trapped and tried to flee by sea aboard the Willem Guslov ocean liner. The ship was torpedoed by a Soviet submarine, killing nearly 10,000 German soldiers and civilians, making it the single worst maritime disaster in history. As Italy was increasingly under Allied control, fascist dictator Benito Mussolini and his mistress were killed by communist fighters in Jeez. northern Italy on April the 28th, by which time Hitler and his own mistress, Eva Braun, had retreated to his own bunker in Berlin, where he planned to stay until the end. Whilst there, he generally retreated into his own mind, to a world where the wonder weapons he believed in so much had saved his Reich. The Soviets had reached the outskirts of Berlin on April the 16th, 1945, thus beginning the final chapter of Nazi Germany's history. For over two weeks, the Soviet army bombarded and fought their way through the rubble of what was left in Berlin, in scenes not too dissimilar to the ones at Stalingrad almost three years earlier. Every available citizen was pressed into the city's defense, with boys as young as 12 being given uniforms from dead German soldiers Jeez. so they could carry on the fight. One unusual unit defending the city, composed of a group of Waffen SS men with Lion insignia, they were British POWs who had volunteered to switch sides after their genetic purity had been confirmed. The Soviet army's battle for the city became hampered by a decreasing level of discipline amongst its ranks, who took to drinking, looting, murder, and mass rape. In Hitler's bunker, fear and insanity reigned over the last of the German leadership. Finally, Hitler himself could take no more, and on April the 30th, 1945, he and his mistress, Eva Braun, took their own lives. Damn. He had left instructions for his guards to cremate his body since he had seen the way Mussolini's body had been treated, and he did not want the same. With the Fuhrer dead, Berlin surrendered on May the 2nd, but the mass rape and looting of the population continued with girls as young as eight being gang raped. Jeez. It was not uncommon for Soviet officers to go around the city in cars hunting unfortunate women who were forced out of their destroyed homes to look for food. Now, with their capital city gone, their leader dead, and the complete collapse of the country, the remaining German military units flocked to the Allies to surrender. On May the 8th, the last of the German army surrendered, and VE Day, victory in Europe, was declared. In the Pacific, however, the fight continued and grew more bloodthirsty as the Japanese became more desperate. In February, the Battle of Iwo Jima began with an intense three-day naval barrage of Japanese positions. In the ensuing battle, the Americans would lose nearly 7,000 men, while the Japanese would lose 90% of over 20,000 men stationed on the islands. Jeez. On April the 1st, 1945, the Americans began an effort to clear the Ryuku Islands, which cantered around the main island of Okinawa. It was to be the last of the island hopping campaigns before the Allies hit Japan themselves, 
In three months of fighting, the Americans would lose another 20,000 dead as the Japanese fought to the bitter end, with even their commander committing suicide rather than surrender. Many military planners looked at these figures and began to realize that an invasion of the Japanese home island was going to be extraordinarily costly in terms of lives and the fighting would probably go on for at least two more years. Something had to be done to end、mm. the war quickly. The Manhattan Project. For several years before the war, there had been a number of theories put forward about how to harness the energy of the atom into a source of power and as a weapon. Winston Churchill was especially interested in such research during the 1930s. And even published papers on its military application. Some preliminary work had begun in Britain, the US, Germany, and Japan. But when the war began, Britain dropped its research efforts to concentrate on defending the country. After Pearl Harbor, however, the Americans began their own project before collaborating with British and Canadian researchers to develop what was soon dubbed the atom bomb, the most、Damn. powerful weapon in history. Under the banner of the Manhattan Project, the scientists labored through 1942 to 1945, developing the world's first atom bomb. At New Mexico's Alamogordo Range on July the 16th, 1945, the first successful atom bomb test was conducted,、Jeez. thus confirming the Allies now had a weapon of unspeakable power. After confirming that the weapon could be carried to a target in Japan by a B 29 Super Fortress bomber, President Truman, who had replaced Roosevelt after his death on April 12, authorized its use against the Japanese city of Hiroshima.、Jeez. On August 6, 1945, the city was decimated by an atom bomb dropped by the B 29 Super Fortress Enola Gay. The bomb, codenamed Little Boy, had an explosive yield equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT and killed over 100,000 people. Jeez, that's a lot. Truman demanded an immediate Japanese surrender or promised there would be more atom bomb attacks in what he described as a reign of ruin. With no surrender forthcoming, Truman ordered another attack, this time、another. on the city of Kokura, but it was obscured by clouds and a smokescreen, so the crew of the B 29 boxcar. Flew to their secondary target, Nagasaki. At 1102 hours, the bomb detonated with a yield of 21,000 tons of TNT, killing over 80,000 more people. On August the 15th, the Japanese emperor announced that the country was to surrender to the Allies, with the formal signing of the surrender taking place on September the 2nd, now remembered as VJ Day, the end of World War II. Damn. This is the end of World War Two. My death and aftermath. We will never know exactly how many died in the Second World War. Most estimates put the toll at a staggering 60 million people, three percent of the world's population in 1940. After the war, the extent of Nazi and Japanese war crimes became public. Leading to a series of trials for war crimes. However, not all of those responsible were brought to justice. Joseph Mengele, a Nazi doctor who performed experiments on twins at concentration camps, escaped to South America, where he died in 1979. Jeez. In the East, Japanese doctor Shiro Ishii traded the research Unit 731 had carried out. For pardons with the U.S. government, who feared it might fall into the hands of the Soviets if they did not. No other war in history has so dramatically changed not just the political world but the everyday world. True. The technologies developed during the war, such as jet engines, rocketry, and newer communications equipment, have all been integrated into our everyday lives. The、True. V2 rockets fired at London by Germany paved the way for the first space rocket. Which launched satellites into space, allowing us、yeah. not only to communicate more effectively across the globe, but keep a close eye on our planet. That's pretty good. The advancement of aircraft technology, particularly the jet engine, made world travel accessible to all, and not just the privileged few. Damn. Even the evil experimentation carried out by the Nazis and Japanese has increased our medical understanding of the human body. Okay. But when all is said and done, 
The end of World War II did not see peace in our time. The victorious allies quickly turned on one another, believing the next war would see Washington and London pitted against Moscow. Germany was divided between East and West, and this became the setting for the Cold War, a period of history where the legacy of World War II actually threatened to annihilate mankind once and for all. Damn. So I guess that's the end of the episode. That was a really good video. I think so it was getting dark, as you can see here. It's unfortunate that so many people died in this war. About 60 million. Jeez. Hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't to see more videos like this one. And like the video too. And I'll see you in the next video. Alright, bye bye.